Therefore, break out the fatted calf and have a celebration. Help that restored brother to leave your time smiling, encouraged, full of joy, and ready to face anything that may come in his direction. Well, that wraps up the five steps of revival. Take a look at it one more time before we leave it. Your whole go in revival is to bring a person to the point of restoration. That starts out with you realizing that they are in need of revival due to the fact of sin. Go to that person and reprove them. Bring them to the point of repentance, of recommitment that I'm going to stop that, move on to a new area of my life and live in obedience, and then have a time of restoration and joy. But you know, my friend, you can never lead another person to experience revival unless you personally have repented as it relates to your own sin. You know, Jesus Christ came to die as far as what he said, so that men and women may be set free. Free from the bonds of sin and free from the fear of death. He shed his blood on the cross of Calvary to offer to all of us the gift of salvation. It's because he died for our sins that we can be set free from our sins. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then as far as God is concerned, you stand today, at this moment, unforgiven. You see, it's not whether or not you feel forgiven. It's whether or not He has forgiven you. And He's been forgiving the same way from the very beginning. For instance, when the Jews in the Old Testament put their hands on the head of their lamb, and the priests killed it to pay for their sins, they were forgiven. But unless they killed that lamb, they weren't forgiven. Well, there's no lamb today, except the one prophesied by prophet after prophet in the Old Testament. The lamb that John the Baptist introduced across that plain when he saw it, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. But just like an ancient Jew today, you have to find a way to get your own personal sins paid for. They had to put their hands on the head of the lamb. And God said, as that lamb was slain, you're forgiven. But today, 2,000 years later, my friend, we still have to get our sins paid for, don't we? And how are you planning to get your sins paid for? The Bible says that there's only one way. It doesn't say there's three ways or five ways. It says there's one way. Today, you have to put your hands on the head of the Lamb, the Lamb of God who was slain for you. If you've never understood God's one condition for forgiveness, which is your acceptance of Christ's death for you, then now is your time. As the Bible would say, now is the acceptable time for you, right where you sit in the privacy of your own heart. If you've never reached out for Jesus Christ, then right now say to him, Lord God, I repent of my sins, and I accept your sacrifice on the cross for me. If that's been what your heart has said, and if you've just trusted Christ, then the Bible would say you've put your hands on the head of your lamb. And as far as the Old Testament, that's what it took to find forgiveness. It hasn't changed. You have to transfer the payment of your sin to something else or someone else. And as you and I transfer our sin to the head of Jesus Christ, we are free from the sins of our past. And now finally, you are free yourself to help others who already know Jesus Christ to be set free from the sins that may bind them today, again, and in the future. Now you've joined the hosts of people around the world who name the name of Jesus Christ and who have been forgiven because not from the blood of bulls and goats, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, may you become so committed to the needs of others and so sold out to the ministry of revival that the Lord himself will regularly send you other people in need of revival. Well, those are the five steps that can help you think through how to help another person to experience revival. But now it's time to move on to the next segment in our law. I want you to turn with me to the seven revival maximizers, and let's consider them together one by one. The first one is to realize that revival is needed by most Christians most of the time. 
Let me ask you a question. What percentage of the average church service or Sunday school class is out of fellowship at any given time? In other words, next Sunday morning, if I were able to see the hearts of all the people in the auditorium, what percentage of them do you think would be in need of revival at that very moment? Well, I've asked that of audiences all across the world, and I've always heard the same answer. Audiences have always said that between 60 and 80 percent of any Sunday school class on any day is in need of revival. You see, revival is severely needed today. If you could ever truly sense the full scope of the need that's sitting right before you every time you teach, you couldn't help but teach for revival much more of the time. Number two. Earnestly seek revival through intense and persistent public and private prayer. Whenever revival occurs in a class or in a church or even in a nation, it's because there was a remnant who had been deep in prayer for revival, usually for some time. When you go back and you read through those revivals, you'll find out that there's a handful, usually of older women, who have banded together in little groups of two or three all across an entire area and are investing the days and the nights of their lives to pray for a mighty movement of God. So if you want a revival in your own heart or the hearts of your students or in your nation, then you must join with the faithful and pray consistently and regularly and intensely for revival. Maximizer number three. Vary your delivery according to your student's spiritual response. As you exist to serve the needs of your students, you need to realize that sometimes they may need a strong and a forceful rebuke in order to come to a point of repentance. Then rebuke them, but rebuke them strongly. At other times, they may just need a soft question like, don't you think it's time for you to come back to the Lord? Or haven't you been away long enough? Whatever it takes to bring them back home, then make sure you do your part and trust the Lord to do His. Maximizer number four, to instruct your students in the knowledge and the practice of the spiritual disciplines. The spiritual discipline. The reason why we all get to points in our lives where we find ourselves in need of revival is because we've strayed from the Lord. We've left Him and gone to something else. Therefore, we need to help our students learn the inner disciplines that will enable them to stay close to the Lord in the first place. There are quite a few spiritual disciplines that the Christian community has, has used throughout the ages. And we've given you quite an extensive presentation of them, including what they are and how to do them in the resource guide for this course. I'd encourage you to study them and to make sure that you are practicing them yourself and then that you were adequately preparing your students on how to stay close to the Lord so they won't need revival because they haven't strayed. Maximizer number five states, verbalize the final call for commitment clearly and expectantly. Clearly and expectantly. When you ask a person to repent, don't mumble. Don't allow yourself to become so tactful that they miss the point. Whenever you ask a person to repent, you ought to fully expect them to repent and to ask that in such a way that it comes across in the tone of your voice. Number six states, to anticipate revival, to be accompanied by intense spiritual warfare. I don't want you to miss the first word there. It's to anticipate something. That is, you ought to expect that when you're trying to help someone to experience revival, the enemy who is opposed to that person coming back to the Lord is going to oppose you. Spiritual warfare is obviously beyond the scope of this course. But if you find yourself unfamiliar with it and you don't know how to recognize it or what to do to have victory over it, then please accept my strongest encouragement to go and read some solid Christian books on the subject. I've listed some of the better ones in the course textbook under this very section. And lastly, Maximizer number seven is to lay yourself before the Lord as a clean vessel committed to revival. Well, I think we've talked enough about revival. By now you understand from the Bible what it is and how to do it. The only question that still remains is, are you committed to teaching that revives the heart? 
Will you lay yourself before the Lord then as a clean vessel committed to help other people experience revival wherever and whenever they cross your path? If it is, and that is what you want, then right at the bottom of your notebook, underneath where it says, I commit to revive the heart, then why don't you put down your initials and today's date? Go ahead, take a moment and solidify your commitment. Your initial and today's date. Give yourself then freely and completely to Christ. Express to Him your deepest desire to be used in this ministry of revival, of helping other people come back to the Lord. You know, friends, I find that I come back home many times right here in a setting very similar to this one. There's something sacred about the place we call church that tugs uniquely at our hearts. Maybe it's because of the cross reminding us of what Christ did on Calvary. Or maybe it's the pulpit where we hear the word of God being preached week after week. Or maybe it's a kneeling rail where some of us humble ourselves from time to time and seek forgiveness and find restoration. For me, though, I think it's the table, the Lord's table, that timeless tradition faithfully practiced by Christians in every nation of the world, remembering what he's done for us and what he means to us. We meet Christ here then, don't we? But it's been our prayer that you have also met him through this series we call the seven laws of the learner as we've shared this special time together that your heart was warmed your resolve strengthened and your skills sharpened and i thought that before we parted company perhaps it would be appropriate and fitting for you to have a quiet moment to meditate on the matters of the heart to make sure one more time that your heart is right before the lord that he is free to move in you and free to speak through you. That no sin hinders his mighty arm. That no unwillingness blocks his powerful message. Take then, Lord, a coal off of the altar before your throne and cleanse our lips and cleanse our hearts. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, Lord. Please send me. But my friend, will you go? Will you speak? Will you teach? Will you do your part to fulfill the Great Commission? Remember the words of Jesus Christ when he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I hope that this seminar has convinced you to never again settle for mediocrity and that it's God's will for you as a teacher to teach for life change. In closing, let me share a story with you of how one teacher, like yourself, came to that same understanding. That teacher's name was Miss Thompson. She had a young boy in her class named Teddy Stollard. Teddy Stollard certainly qualified as one of the least disinterested in school, musty, wrinkled clothes, his hair was never combed. One of those kids in school with a deadpan face, expressionless, sort of a glassy, unfocused stare. When Miss Thompson spoke to Teddy, he, he almost answered in monosyllables.